So this morning's encouragement has to do with uh, rewards for service, because I was going to do a lesson on sin and its rewards, but when I got done, I was a little bummed out. So I <laughs> thought, well, if I'm going to be up here encouraging and exhorting people, I need to make it just a little more positive. So I'm going to take a few minutes this morning and look at some of uh, the rewards that Christians can expect for their faithful service. Um, we're going to, the opening scripture is going to be in Matthew 16, picking up in about verse 24. <clears throat> Matthew 16 and 24. And Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. First promise, lose your life for the Lord and you will find it. A good life. I had a similar lifestyle as my brother Steve, and you, you've heard about some of his uh, adventures. Well, I had pretty much the same adventures. There was a lot of hangovers in my early days. As a matter of fact, people encouraged me to buy stock in Tylenol. They said, man, you'll make a fortune because you're contributing all the time. So <clears throat> the life that the Lord provides is going to be a good life. And an excellent question follows, continually asking ourselves, what would we give in exchange for our soul? Well, nothing we would reply, but are we fooling ourselves? We'll get back to that later. Jesus said he would come in the glory of his Father with his angels to reward those who attended the proper church. Nope, didn't say that but to reward each individual according to their works. So the reward is going to be based on what we do as individuals, not who we know or where we go, and we should be doing something. <clears throat> it's becoming more and more apparent as I, I walk with the Lord. This is a very, very personal walk. It's not a group walk. Now, while we're all here as a group this morning, we exhort one another, we encourage one another, we're a body come together, we all have different talents, we can do things as a group and accomplish much, but our individual walk is ours. I can't walk for anybody else, they can't walk for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> Picking up in about verse 6, and we're going to read several verses, which is not my norm. I like to give you little bullet points and keep moving and just inundate you with many scriptures. But this is going to be a couple of long ones this morning because you can't really break them out. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, picking up in about verse 6, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth says, I planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. 
So maybe you aren't currently sowing seeds as you go, but what does the waterer do? He helps the plants to grow. He pulls out the weeds that comes up, checking on the plant on a regular basis. I can tell you personally that Steve is not a good weeder of a garden. I would come home on leave from California and I would have to go out and weed his garden because it was overgrown. So some little tidbit about Brother Steve that you should know, he doesn't weed well. <clears throat> I think he's a pretty good reader. I'm sorry? Weed well. Re reader. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Plants need to be attended. And Steve can't do it all. We can be ones to attend the needs of some of the other plants that we're growing with. So whether you're a planter or a water, it doesn't matter. Nor does it matter if the foundation has already been laid. If you are adding to it, then you're doing the work you're supposed to be doing. And if it isn't profitable for the hearers, you will still have your reward for giving it your best effort. Because we're supposed to scatter seed. We're supposed to share what we know, when we know it. But we're not responsible for the outcome. <clears throat> the point is that all laborers are rewarded regardless of the type of work that they do. So another scripture I want to share this morning is on Matthew chapter 20. Again, it's another long one. Bear with me. I, I ask forgiveness. As you can see, that you know this is sort of topical, and you just really can't cut it off in the middle. So Matthew chapter 20, picking up um, <clears throat> in about verse 1. Jesus speaking. He says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour. Okay, by the way, so we're going to start, <clears throat> you know, the first hour, let's try 6 a.m., just so you have a time going here. So third hour is going to be 9 a.m., all right? So he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour, or about noon, and the ninth hour, about three o'clock in the afternoon, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, 5 p.m., <clears throat> he went out and found others standing idle. I don't know why they're not eating dinner. It's five o'clock. And said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those who were hired about the eleventh hour, 5 p.m., they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last, for many are called, but few chosen. The reward is going to be the same regardless of how long or how little time we are laboring. I look back at Frank and I'm thinking, he's been laboring a long time. And I look back there and I see Wade and I say, he's just beginning. Oh, lucky him. But the key word is labor. Even if it is but just an hour or all day, there is work to be done. And at the end of the day, there's to be a recompense for your labor. Is coming to church laboring in the field? Is reading your Bible laboring in the field? Well, maybe you are spending a great deal of time laboring by yourself. Have you invited someone who isn't very 
involved to join you in some of your labors. Did you ask them once and they couldn't, so you just gave up? Or maybe they just weren't as helpful as you wanted them to be and decided you could do it yourself. Yeah, Tom Parker and I, we've had these discussions. We argue about how things are supposed to be done when we're down here laboring together, but that's okay. It's all in fun. Some are called in the first part of their life, and they will, they will labor much in the heat of the day. And hear the call at the end of their life and receive the same reward. So what type of service or labor is expected of us? What does God want from us and what doesn't he want? Way back in the Old Testament, Moses wrapped it up in a nutshell, what would please God when he said in Deuteronomy 10, 12, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Fear him, reverent respect, walk in all his ways, love him, serve him with all your hearts and soul. <clears throat> and I've shared that when I went out to California and I was talking to, to my brother-in-law you know, about the gospel, and he was listening to me, and then he would ask me, well, why, why do people do this and why do people do that? And I kept saying, Bob, Bob, Bob. I don't want to talk about what other people are doing. I only want to talk about you having a personal walk with God. That's what I want to talk about, how you can have a personal relationship. Yeah, but why does the Catholic Church do this? Or why do the Baptists? I, I don't care, Bob. I don't want to talk about that. I don't have that much time, Bob. We're only going to talk about establishing a personal walk with the Lord. This personal walk, I can't tell you how to do it. You're going to have to develop it on your own. But the one thing I know for sure, it's hard to have a relationship with somebody you don't know. So you have to learn about them. And the way you're going to learn about God is in his holy scriptures. And as you read them, you're going to see stuff and you're going to learn more about how God feels about things, and things he likes, things he doesn't like. Even you do that with your friends. That's how you develop friends. <clears throat> I'm going to digress for a minute, if you don't mind. I had a friend, Greg Somerville. Nobody liked Greg. Everybody thought he was a jerk. I was the only one that was a friend of Greg Somerville. He was one of the most annoying people that you would ever meet. Bless you. The, uh, one of the main things about Greg is he had no filters, you know? Ron, do you mind if I pick on you for a second? You got broad shoulders. You can take it, right? Yeah. A little slope, but okay. If Greg didn't like Ron's shirt, he would say, man, that's an ugly shirt. He doesn't even know Ron. But that's how he was. Greg had no filters. So everybody disliked him because Greg was a very sarcastic individual. And he would say anything to anybody. He went out golfing with... Uh, Mr. Pete and his neighbor one day, and he didn't know the neighbor at all. By the third hole when they were golfing, he was asking Mr. Pete, can I hit this kid in the face with my putter? <laughs> I mean, that's just how Greg was. And people would ask me, well, how come is it you like him? I said, it's not so much liking Greg. I just ignore the first two things that he does that I don't like, and all the rest of him is fine. So if you can overlook a couple of the bad things, you can get you have a lot more friends. That's just a hint. All right. But to know God, you're going to have to be in, in your scriptures so that you know what he likes and what he doesn't like. If you looked at a lot of your own personal relationships and your friends, you're going to find out there's many things about them that's similar to what you like. You don't make friends with people who are just completely the opposite of you, and you have absolutely nothing in common. Well, how are you going to know what you have in common with God until you start reading the scripture? And as you study your scriptures and you learn about what he likes, well, I can do that. I want to be pleasing to him because he has given me the opportunity of eternal life. So I owe him a lot. Yeah, I'll bend over backwards for this guy. Moving on. I know. 
Jesus declared it's still the right thing to do in the New Testament when he was asked by the lawyer what the greatest commandment was. In Matthew 22, 37, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Well, how are you going to love the Lord your God if you don't know him? The only way you're going to know him is from the scriptures. So you have a responsibility to study the scriptures, to know the Lord so you can love him. This is first and great commandment, and second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is how you're going to have that personal daily walk with the Lord. Remember in the stewardship I mentioned about the idea, you and the Lord going to work together? Take him with you. He doesn't have to stay at home. He doesn't have to stay inside your Bible in, in your bedroom. Take the Lord with you. Talk to him. Silently, probably, for the most part. But you have to be in communication with him. That's why you were given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that's going to be communicating to God, telling him your thoughts and what you're thinking about. It's not like you have to, okay, everybody, I know this lunchroom has got 100 people in here, and some of you are already eating, but let's stop and give thanks, because it'll make the food taste better. By the way, I did that. Doesn't go over real good, but they will stop. <laughs> okay. Now, we could spend a lot of time trying to prove that we do love the Lord and that we are serving him with our hearts and our souls. But God will test us. God will know. And the results of the test are the real proof. Not what we say or proclaim, but our actions confirm our love to God. Our actions confirm our love. Okay, I'll go a little faster. In uh, 1 Samuel 15, we have the story of uh, King Saul. 1 Samuel 15, and about verse 13. So Samuel goes to Saul. Samuel is the prophet. Saul's the king. Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I perform the commandment of the Lord. Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Saul said, Well, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. And Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Well, speak on. And Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, utterly destroy the sinners and the Amalekites and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Then Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Better to obey is better than sacrifice, and heed that of the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So, <clears throat> Saul had a definition of what it meant in his mind. And he thought he had complied. But that isn't what God said. How many of the Lord's commands do we strive to comply with? Usually they are the most convenient and easy to do. Then there are those that are harder. And then there is those that we put in the category of, well, those are the things I'm working on. Hmm. We just can't give lip service to our service. It must be more than words alone. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7:21. Matthew 7, 21, picking up in about verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. <clears throat> These folks didn't have a personal relationship with God. They had the idea that they could just do anything that they wished and it would be acceptable. <clears throat> Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock, and the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Doing the sayings of the Lord, being a faithful laborer, makes you successful when the rains, the floods, and the winds come. And they will come. So does this mean that we all have to be teachers? We all have to preach from up front? No. Matthew 25. I told you there was a lot of verses in this. I'm still watching the time. We're still on track. Everything's cool. Matthew 25, picking up in about <clears throat> verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Meeting the physical necessities of those around us in need makes us a co-laborer with the Lord. It isn't just teaching and preaching. It's letting our light shine in the dark. Because it is a dark and dreary world. Reaching out and giving of ourselves. This giving of ourselves can be within the body. Encouraging one another. Encouraging those younger in the faith. Maybe even getting involved in their lives a little bit. And doing things outside of the church with them. There's a reward waiting for each and every faithful Christian. And if you want to know what the result of not reaching out and meeting the needs of the others are, then please read verses 41 through 46 on your own time. I also believe that the reward is the same regardless of the amount of time spent laboring. There's a scripture that indicates that those who put in a little extra effort... <coughs> From their labors are recompensed accordingly. That's in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 9. I believe that that giving of ourselves and our time is an important resource. If you give a little time, you're going to get a little in return. The more you give, the more you get. You can't outgive God. If we only give 15 minutes a week towards reading our scriptures, how can we expect to be a powerhouse of the gospel message? Let us give of ourselves cheerfully, not expecting anything in return. Uh, Luke 14. <clears throat> Luke 14. And before we read this, Just think about this for a moment. Have you done it? Could you do it? And will you do it? Now let's read it. Luke 14, starting in verse 12. Jesus speaking, Then he also said to him who invited him, 
When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. I haven't given too many feasts at my house, but I'm sure some of the meals that we prepared would be considered a feast by many. But you know, the one thing that I've done, you know, that turkey dinner thingy that they have down there in Bellevue, or any fundraiser in Olivet, you know, to raise money for different things where, you know, you pay for a meal or you pay for others' meals. That's all part of this process here. You are giving blindly or anonymously to others so that they may have something and you're not going to get a reward for it. They're not even going to know you've given. So whenever you give a chance to give anonymously, do it. Anybody, anybody been a recipient of somebody buying your meal for you ahead of you in the drive-thru? Not only that happened, I walked in one to the Lux Cafe. How many knows the Lux Cafe? Yeah, good place to eat, right? Oh yeah, I like the Lux Cafe. Linda Lou and I went in there one morning and we were dragging Landon, the grandson, in there with us. And he was being a good kid. And we were sitting down, we were interacting with him, you know, coloring and doing all the normal things that grandparents do. Waitress came up, took our order, disappeared. When she brought the bill back, she said, I'm sorry, but the meal's already been paid for. I said, what do you mean the meal was paid for? I'm looking around, do I know anybody in here? I didn't know a soul in there. And she says, it's one of our regulars. He does this kind of way. He saw you with the grandkid and just wanted you to have a great day. Isn't that awesome? That's a blessing from the Lord, and I hope he was blessed by paying for my meal. I don't even know what he looks like. I can't pay him back. Hence the scripture, the point. So, do it anonymously if you can. Oops. I'll go faster. <clears throat> if you had $10,000 to invest, what would be your concern? The return on your investment. If you put it in a high risk, oh, what? Jamie, please, what? <laughs> I thought you were mistaking Deuteronomy. <laughs> when you do it anonymously, you said do it anonymously. <laughs> I was about to turn to Deuteronomy. <laughs> Is that like second hallucinations? <laughs> okay. It's hard to forget that. All right. She's back, everybody. Anyway, um, Mark 10, 28. All in love. <clears throat> 10, 28. Jesus guarantees a return on our investment. Here Peter began to say to him, Lord, see, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Now, when you read that about leaving family members behind, it's not like, okay, I'm moving to Ohio because I need to leave them behind. You have family members missing here today that they have chosen that they don't have any interest in your life with Christ? You've left them behind. That's what this is referring to. You made the choice between them and Christ, and you've chosen Christ. That's how this applies. So I just want you to know, most of us in this room have done so. Receive in this present time a hundredfold the things of this life along with persecutions, eternal life. Well, wait a minute. How did I end up with more relatives than I left behind? You're sitting there, brothers and sisters in Christ. I have inherited so much hunting gear from Blaine 
He doesn't even know it yet. <laughs> but when I'm getting closer to passing away, he's one of my primary sources of distributing my hunting gear. I'm just going to give it to my brother in Christ. And he's smiling about this. He's thinking, yeah, hurry up. <laughs> hurry up. I'm ready. Brother, give it to me. So that's how our family has increased. It's a spiritual family. And we're here together today to enjoy one another's company. Psalms 126, 5 through 6 says, Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, weeping and bearing seed for the sowing shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. <clears throat> How can we who know the consequences of facing God outside of Christ not rejoice when someone we know and have shared the good news with repents and is immersed, immersed for the forgiveness of their sins and that they receive the gift of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. For, you know, you parents out there who have had children who are immersed into Christ, yeah, it, it's an incredible feeling. It's, wow, what a blessing. We rejoice when someone comes to the knowledge <laughs> of the truth and gives their life over to Christ. Now, sometimes you may find that, you know, you have shared your faith to the best of your ability and the hearer is not responding. Then along comes somebody else and, and bingo, they're converted. Well, hallelujah. It's a time for rejoicing, not anger or jealousy because they were able to convince them. Who knows which one is going to share the words to trigger the heart to obey? And that's a worldly concept, by the way. Some of you know I was a Marine Corps recruiter for a very short period of time. And the head recruiter told me when I first got there, and I'm looking at all these cards saying that they tried to contact, don't call again, you know, we'll, we'll blow up your building or whatever. And he's telling me to call these people up to talk to, you know, little Stevie about joining the Marine Corps. They always use Johnny, but I'm annoyed with that, so we're going with Stevie. <laughs> call up little Stevie and try to convince him to join the Marine Corps. And I said, yeah, but look, many people have called and they're not even interested. He says, you don't know if they're going to respond to your voice or not. It may be your voice that convinces them, or maybe time has passed, and it's now ready for them to hear the scriptures. We don't know. My brother-in-law has been my best friend for a very long time, over 40 years. And I just got the opportunity a couple of months ago to share the gospel with him for the first time. Got to be patient. Anyway, there's undoubtedly many verses that we could have added to this encouragement regarding the reward that we may receive in, in the afterlife and for our service here on the earth. <clears throat> but we just need to be found doing what the Lord would have us to do and have that personal walk with him. It isn't some far off down the road reward that you're going to have. You will have rewards here on this earth. You may have great joy if you have the opportunity to share the scripture and they accept it. That's a joy that can't be bought in a store. We can have great joy in here and now whether we're sowers, reapers, or helpers to those who are in need of help. All of us fit into this, these categories. And therefore joy is available to each and every one who's a willing participant. The body has a mission to accomplish and there are rewards for our labors. The question is, are we pulling together? Are we striving towards the common goal? Do we understand that there's a reward along the way and for those who are diligently laboring? Remember the earlier scripture where the landowner went out in the morning, find laborers, and he went out in the first hour, the third hour, and the sixth, and the ninth, and the eleventh hour? Did you notice he found laborers at each of those hours? Did you notice that they also were willing to go out and work? Are we willing to go to work in the fields, or are we just going to stand on the street corner waiting for the really cushy type jobs with air conditioning and not too many hours with lots of benefits? Sometimes the laborer is 7, 8 o'clock at night, the phone rings, and somebody needs to talk. That's laboring for the Lord. All of us can do that. We can be encouragement to one another. The bottom line, the laborer receives rewards even for one hour's worth of work. Those who do nothing receive nothing. 
Back to Matthew 16, as we wrap this thing up, picking up in uh, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for a soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he will reward each according to his works. So as you go forth this week, meditate on this scripture and ask yourself a couple of questions. Am I taking up my cross? Am I putting to death my carnal nature? Am I focused on the things of this life? Or am I looking at the things above, the things of God? Am I walking daily with God and sowing, watering, exhorting, encouraging, or doing whatever I can to be a good servant for the Lord? There's much to consider in just these four verses, and we're done in 37 minutes. I'm sorry. Thank you for your attention. But Stan will be dismissed with a word of prayer.